Okay, so next slide, please. In 1983, Grace Murray Hopper, then 76 years old, was made an admiral by special presidential appointment. In 1987, the Navy named its computer center here in San Diego, well, there in San Diego for her. And in 1996, four years after her death, it launched the newest Ali Burke class guided missile destroyer, Hopper. The recipient of numerous medals, awards, and honorary degrees, Hopper was esteemed both for her giant intellect and for her unceasing energy. Her message to everyone was above all to innovate and never to be tied to the old or customary way of doing things. What was it about this woman that attracted such recognition? What did she accomplish for the US Navy that earned such praise? What skills did she possess so valuable to a tradition bound male dominated military bureaucracy that she overcame the barriers of gender and age so often inhibiting to others? Part of the answer to these questions lies in Hopper's area of expertise, computer science. But that answer raises other questions because computing like the military was a field dominated by men. Furthermore, it has been mostly a rapidly changing young person's game. When Hopper began her computing career in 1944 at the age of 37, the Mark I on which she was trained could complete three operations a second. Nine years later, the UNIVAC computer on which she worked could complete 1,000 operations a second. In 1963, when Hopper still had 23 working years ahead of her, the fastest computer around, the CDC 6600, could execute 3 million instructions a second. What was it about Hopper that enabled her to keep up with these changes and to carve out successful careers in computing and the military? two areas where women are still underrepresented today. In part, Hopper's upbringing explains how she came to play such an important role in the development of computing. Next slide, please. Born in nine, on the 9th of December, 1906, Grace Murray was the oldest of three children. Here she is with her younger sister, Mary, and her younger brother, Roger. She was raised in New York City and spent summers in the family cottage on Lake Wentworth in Wolfboro, New Hampshire. Perhaps because her father, a successful insurance broker, lost both legs to hardening of the arteries when his children were young, he early instilled in them the, no the notion that they must be self-reliant and learn to support themselves. To this end, his two daughter, he wanted his two daughters to have the same educational opportunities as his son, a rare notion in those days. Hopper gained an early love of mathematics from both sides of the family, and she was also a persistent tinkerer, though her youthful zeal for disassembling gadgets like clocks and irons for years exceeded her ability to reassemble them. Typically, her parents never discouraged these activities, although when she took apart all seven alarm clocks in their home, they placed limits on how many devices she could disassemble at one time. Next slide, please. In 1924, Hopper went to Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York, graduating with honors in math and physics in 1928. She got a fellowship to study mathematics at Yale, and in 1930, she received an MA from there, and that same year married Vincent Foster Hopper. Vincent's family also had a summer house in Wolfboro, and the two had dated while in college. After their marriage, Hopper continued her graduate studies at Yale, receiving a PhD in mathematics in 1934, a rare accomplishment for a woman in those days. Vincent, in the meantime, was teaching English at NYU and pursuing a doctorate at Columbia. With PhD in hand, Hopper went into one of the few professions open to her, teaching. Between 1931 and 1943, she worked her way from instructor to associate professor of mathematics at her alma mater, Vassar College. She was a very popular teacher and her practical lessons were particularly appealing. One of, her most, one of the most famous of these was that she taught displacement by filling a bathtub full of water and having her, one of her students climb in with predictable results. World War II brought an end to Hopper's predictable academic life as well as to her marriage, long under strain from the couple's heavy schedules and long commutes. She and Vincent separated in 1941 and were divorced in 1945. 
Later, when Hopper became nationally known, she was a subject of numbers of myths. One of these was that Vincent had died during the war. While Hopper herself never propagated that story, never, uh, nor did she ever publicly deny it. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, there were no women in the Navy or in any other military service either. But on the 30th of July, 1942, a reluctant Congress authorized the establishment of the Navy Women's Reserve. The Navy appointed G Dean Virginia Gildersleeve of Barnard College, long an advocate of women's causes, to draw up the initial plans for a women's naval force, the WAVES, women accepted for voluntary emergency service. Although, as Gildersleeve later expressed it, if the Navy could possibly have used dogs or ducks or monkeys, certain of the older admirals would probably have greatly preferred them to women. Gildersleeve recruited Wellesley President Mildred McAfee to head the waves during the war. Though eventually spending 43 years in the Navy, Hopper initially had to fight to get in. In 1942, she was already 35 and considered too old for enlistment. Mathematics, moreover, was a profession crucial to the war effort. Teaching mathematics, mathematics was classified as an essential occupation. To make matters even worse, Hopper weighed only 105 pounds, considered 16 pounds underweight for her height of five feet, six inches. She persevered, however, later explaining that she'd wanted to serve more directly than just by teaching. Since her maternal great-grandfather had been a Civil War Rear Admiral, she said she naturally went Navy. She also liked to explain that she looked good in blue. Nevertheless, the Navy at first refused to admit Hopper. She finally negotiated a waiver for the weight requirement, obtained a leave of absence from Vassar, and in December 1943, at the age of 37, she was sworn into the U.S. Naval Reserve. Uh, next slide, please. Then, after graduating first in her class at the Northampton Midshipman School for Waves in June 1944, Lieutenant J.G. Hopper was sent directly to the Navy's Bureau of Ships Computation Project at Harvard University. Although the growing data management needs of World War II accelerated the development of modern digital computers, especially in Britain and the United States, most were not operational until after the conflict ended. A notable exception in America was the Mark I. Brainchild of Howard Aiken, professor of physics and applied mathematics at Harvard, the Mark I was the culmination of a project he began in 1937 as a graduate student. Frustrated by the tedious and time-consuming mathematical cal calculations required for his PhD dissertation, Aiken designed a system to produce such calculations automatically. Engineers at IBM built Aiken's machine under his guidance, but used many of their own patented parts. What emerged from this co collaboration the Harvard Mark I was the first functional, large-scale, automatically sequenced, general-purpose digital computer to be produced in America. The press called it a robot brain, but Aiken told them it was just a lazy man's dream intended for use in scientific numerical computation. Next slide, please. When the Mark I was finally completed at IBM in 1944, IBM president Thomas J. Watson gave it to Harvard as a gift. That spring, it was installed at the university where the US Navy, desperate for gunnery and ballistics calculations, leased it for the duration of the war. Aiken, a Naval Reserve officer, was put in charge of his own Mark I. You can see that the Boston Daily Globe called it a calculator, the distinction between computer and calculator had not yet been established. Next slide, please. The machine the Navy took over was an enormous monster, some 50 feet long and eight tall, and it filled an entire room. It had more than 750,000 parts, used 530 miles of wire, and weighed about five tons. A four horsepower electric motor drove all the mechanical parts by a system of gears and chains. While there were many sorts of electromechanical desk calculators then in common use, and IBM punched card machines were numerous, the Mark I was a rare creature, an electromechanical digital computer destined to dominate the field for only a few years, briefly bridging the gap between calculators and electronic computers. 
Next slide, please. Most impressive were the Mark I speed of computation and its automatic functioning, enabling it to proceed through a series of arithmetic operations without human intervention. Automatic sequence control was accomplished according to programmed instructions fed into the machine on punched paper tape, while the output was handled either by punched cards or by two electric typewriters. The multiple purpose capabilities of the Mark I, the fact that it could be set to accomplish a wide range of different types of numerical calculations was one of its great strengths and set it apart from other contemporary com computing devices. For Aiken, who always wanted practical results, flexibility, accuracy, and reliability were even more important than speed. He was well aware of ongoing experimental work using vacuum tubes to replace relatively slow mechanical relays, but it, he believed it was better to sacrifice some speed for a device that could be put to use immediately during the war. Next slide, please. Uh, here's the team running the Mark I. In the front, the officers, Dick Block, Ed Beverly, Howard Aiken himself in the middle, Grace Hopper, obviously, and Bob Campbell. And I um, was able to interview both Dick Block and Bob Campbell, well, met them and many times. Unfortunately, um, Hopper was already dead by the time I started the project and Aiken too had died long before. Um, in the back are the enlisted, they were called Specialist I, of former IBM employees who had worked on the construction of the Mark I, so they understood it well. From the beginning, Aiken's computation lab was something of a stepchild to both Navy and Harvard. Tucked away in the basement of Croft Laboratory among surrounding ivory towers, it was guarded night and day by Navy armed guards and run by a small team of amateur Naval officers, who you see there in front of you. As Aiken put it, he was the only man in the world who was ever commanding officer of a computer. It was certainly Hopper's mathematics background rather than any familiarity with computers that instigated her assignment to Harvard. 30 years later, when she was asked how she became interested in computing, Hopper replied that she'd had no choice in the matter. I was ordered to the first computer in the United States by the United States Navy, she said and I reported to the Mark I computer. Next slide, please. Under Aiken's guidance, Hopper learned how to program the Mark I, and she, Aiken, and Dick Block have a very valid claim to being the first ever real computer programmers. Everyone at the lab worked 18 to 20 hour days, the long hours and the stress relieved by humor and jokes, many initiated by Hopper. They particularly enjoyed making fun of Lieutenant Berkeley, Hopper liked to work with him closely and had great respect for him, but in the hothouse atmosphere of the computation lab, nothing was sacred. Berkeley did not know much about the Navy, and in the beginning, he was scared to death of Aiken and sent Hopper little notes asking for help. He always stamped and dated everything and soon began writing Aiken little memos that he left on his desk. Half the time, Aiken just threw them away. And when Berkeley found out, he was furious with Hopper and the others for not having the guts to tell him sooner. We used to plague the hell out of Berkeley, Hopper recalled years later with obvious glee. One day they got a roll of toilet paper and dated and stamped each sheet and then sent it to Berkeley. They also started the story circulating that before he went to bed at night, he would date and stamp the sheets so that he would know where he was when he awoke the next morning. Next slide, please. Here's Hopper with um, Spec White and the input tape. In spite of its relative isolation, tucked away in a basement, a surprisingly steady stream of visitors found their way to the computation lab to see the amazing automatic brain at work and to consult on possible problems to feed it. Dick Block had written a magnificent program to use when admirals and other VIPs came by. It would display everything. Cards would read, cards would punch, the tapes would all move, lights would flash, recalled Hopper, and it didn't do a darn thing in computation, but it put everything in motion. Next slide, please. Here is Hopper at the key punch. When problems were brought to the lab, even by other mathematicians, they had to be prepared for the machine using the code book 
which covered every known type of mathematical calculation. Finally, the operator would punch the appropriate code, code holes in the paper tape to feed the problem to the machine. Thus began the concept of programming, central to Aiken's understanding of computing, and perhaps the most important lesson Hopper learned from him. Interviewed years later, Hopper liked to explain how it was that her work at Harvard during the war was really in advance of anything else then being done on computers. To that e extent, she noted that she had a slight head start on programming because I started in 44 on the Mark I. One of the first problems the lad received from the Navy concerned range tables for anti-aircraft guns. Progress in the development of high capacity projectiles had been so much faster than the ability to create range tables that in 1942, the Navy, Navy was about 500 tables behind. Until the Mark I became operational, Hopper recalled how the Navy had to rely on acres of girls using hand-driven calculators to create such stable, uh, tables. The Mark I speedily spewed out those tables. Among many other things, the Mark I also ran numbers for the MIT Radiation Lab and calculated the effective range of magnetic and acoustic mines. In August 1944, when the celebrated mathematician John von Neumann from the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton came to the computation lab for calculations he needed, he didn't know a computer from a tomato basket, Dick Block told me. After the war, von Neumann went on to do impressive work in computer design. But when he arrived at Harvard, he had to rely on the Navy's mathematicians for the huge task of programming and sequencing his problem. Von Neumann was wrestling with a difficult implosion problem for detonating plutonium, which involved him in lengthy ma mathematical calculations. The numbers run on the Mark I were necessary to complete his work, which resulted in the plutonium bomb dropped on Nagasaki on the 9th of August, 1945. This is certainly the most dramatic example of the part played by the Mark I in the war effort. As I explained before, in the course of her long career, Hopper was the subject of many myths. Myth number two was that she invented the term, term bug for computer glitches. In fact, the term had long been in use to explain unexpected failures in mechanical devices. But the myth persisted and was even repeated in Hopper's obituary in the New York Times. In 1946, after the end of the war, Commander Aiken was discharged from the Navy and resumed his academic career at Harvard as a professor and director of the Computation Lab, which now became a civilian organization. Demobilization generally meant loss of jobs for women, but the new field in which the Navy had trained Hopper created the opposite effect opening post-war opportunities to her, since relatively few men had had the same training and experience. In the 1940s, you know, as Hopper loved to point out, you could have put all the computer people in the country into one small room. So instead of returning to teach mathematics at Vassar, where Hopper was offered a full professorship, she remained at the computation lab as a research fellow working on the new Mark II and electronic Mark III. After three years, when she failed to be promoted by Harvard or to receive tenure, which was the usual case for women, she was forced to leave. During those three years, in addition to her work at Harvard, Hopper served as a Naval Reserve Officer in Boston, assigned to an ordnance unit. When women had been admitted to the regular Navy in 1948, Hopper had wanted to join, but she was two years over the cutoff age of 38, so she had to content herself with remaining in the Naval Reserve. Next slide, please. In uh, 1949, after careful consideration of the many job offers she received, Hopper joined the Eckert Morkley Computer Corporation in Philadelphia because she figured they were the closest to having a commercial electronic computer, the Univac, up and running. She'd had an interview at IBM, but that was back in the days where they still had an IBM flag and sang songs about it. And that was too much for me, she recalled. Hopper remained with the UNIVAC division through Eckert Morkley's acquisition by Remington Rand, and then through the merger, which created Sperry Rand, later to become Unisys. Even while at Harvard, Hopper had been relatively uninterested in computer hardware, focusing on instead 
are methods to speed the writing of coding instructions for individual programs. It was in this field, in what was later called software, that she made her major contributions, both to commercial computing and to the Navy. Meanwhile, for 18 years as a civilian in, in industry, living and working in Philadelphia, Hopper maintained her Naval Reserve status, assigned to the 4th Naval District in the Philadelphia Navy Yard. She worked as a consultant on many classified projects, each requiring her to learn new fields of application. Serving as an ordnance officer, Hopper put in two weeks stints of active duty, which in her case usually meant undertaking computing tasks for the Navy. She wrote a program for a rocket trajectory and one for a turbine problem. She also wrote specifications for existing and projected computers. Already, Hopper's computing services were described as important to the Navy, and it was regretted that she did not have more time to give to the reserves. In May 1952, Hopper completed a project for the Bureau of Ordnance. Summing up her accomplishment, her CEO wrote, this wave officer rates higher than the main, uh, male officers in the unit of corresponding rank and length of service in value to the Naval service. Remington Rand was always supportive of Hopper's absences on Navy duty, perhaps in large part because the Navy was one of its most valuable customers. Not only the Korean War, but also the general Cold War threat suggested that supplying the military would continue to be good business. Indeed, military applications remain very important in advancing computer technologies. Grace Hopper, supreme pragmatist and effective public speaker, bridged the gap between the civilian producers and the military users of computer technology, benefiting both sides and enhancing her own reputation at the same time. During these years, Hopper continued to receive outstanding commendations on her fitness reports for her expertise. Having been promoted to the rank of commander in 1953, she was described in glowing terms as an outstanding officer whose value to the Navy could not be measured by normal standards. She was seen as a leader in the field of development of automatic programming and one of the very few people in the entire country who understands this new vital field. The ever-increasing rate at which new computers were coming into use was leading to shortages of trained programmers. Hopper pro proposed to deal with the shortage by demystifying computing and simplifying programming. This was still the first generation of electronic digital computer technology. But rather than guard the secrets of the trade, as some of her colleagues tended to do, Hopper was all in favor of openness. What followed logically for her was the idea that plain English might be used in coding her early interest in simplifying code writing and her anticipation of the commercial uses of computers placed Hopper in the vanguard of these developments. Next slide, please. In 1957, Hopper completed Flowmatic, the first English language compiler. By 1960, Flowmatic became one of the main ingredients in the collaborative creation of COBOL. And you'll see that she's holding a COBOL uh, instruction sheet in her hand. Uh, COBOL soon to be widely adopted as a universal computer language. Another myth that attached to Hopper was that she invented COBOL, although in fact she was only one on the committee responsible for its creation. Nevertheless, during her years in private industry, Hopper became famous for her roles in the invention of the compiler and in the creation of COBOL, still today one of the most widely used programming languages. Indeed, Hopper is well known in the computer field as Grandma Cobol and the Grand Lady of Software. By 1964, Hopper's fame had spread so extensively that she did not have to apply for routine two-week Naval Reserve duties, as did many officers. Cognizant activities in the Navy, aware of her eminence in the profession, actively solicit her service and advice, wrote her commanding officer. They invite her again and again, he concluded. And yet there was more to Hopper's longevity in the Navy than just technical skills, valuable though they were. Perhaps one of the reasons she was so well suited to military life is that she was quintessentially a team player. According to her commanding officer, her tact and understanding with her associates left little to be desired. 
and her enthusiasm, dedication, and loyalty to the naval service was described as boundless. Finally, however, the years caught up with Hopper. By her own account, late in 1996, she received a letter from the Chief of Naval Personnel telling her that she served 23 years, which was over 20. I knew that, she loved to tell interviewers. The letter also informed her that she was about to turn 60. I knew that too, said Hopper. The final paragraph of the letter asked her to apply for retirement, which she reluctantly did, effective the 31st of December, 1966. Her final fitness report stated simply that Commander Hopper was an outstanding officer in all respects and a wonderful person. It was the saddest day of my life, recalled Hopper. Only seven months later, the Navy repented its bureaucratic efficiency and reversed the decision to let Hopper go. With the naval expansion in response to the Vietnam War and the consequent increasing demand for computerized systems, Hopper's skills were once again recognized as invaluable. On the 1st of August, 1967, Grace Hopper was recalled to active duty with a temporary appointment for six months. She stayed 19 years. Her most important work was in the standardization of Navy computer languages. Hopper had been recognized by her commanding officer for her exceptionally fine ability to deal with all levels of the military and the public in official as well as personal matters. Coupled with her excellent administrative ability, this made Hopper a natural to implement a comprehensive program of standardization of COBOL in the Navy, replacing the numerous and incompatible versions of the language then in use. After World War II, there had been a rapid growth in computing in the Navy with a corresponding proliferation of computers. Each Navy installation had its own machines and its own machine programming language, and there was little central direction. Indeed, the Navy had become a Tower of Babel of computer languages. Hopper's accomplishment was that she was able to standardize COBOL, not only for the Navy, but for the entire Department of Defense. This influenced a whole industry because vendors, for whom the Navy was a major purchaser, for the first time were forced to produce compilers that were compatible with Hopper's COBOL. The significance of Hopper's achievement is seen in the recognition that she received. Next slide, please. Most ironically, in 1969, she received the Data Processing Management Association's first Computer Sciences Man of the Year Award. She also received steady promotions in the Navy. Next slide. In 1974, from commander to captain, presided over by Elmo Zumwalt, the Chief of Naval Operations, Next slide, please. In 1975, Hopper made captain, and here she is seen in her Pentagon office, the skull and crossbones on her desk, symbolizing her group's habit of liberating the equipment they needed uh, in the middle of the night when the other offices were empty. Although you can't see it in this photograph, Hopper also always had in her office a clock that was backwards, thus making her point that there's always more than one way to do things. Next slide, please. In 1983, Hopper was promoted from captain to commodore by John Lehman, the SECNAV, with President Ronald Reagan looking on. Meanwhile, Hopper's fame had been spreading while she spent her last years as a publicist for Navy computing. She gave two to 300 speeches annually, as well as interviews, and was the subject of many articles. She even appeared on 60 Minutes and the David Letterman Show. Next slide, please. Here she is giving a speech giving a speech, ever practical, she used many props to help get her points across. Most famous were what she's holding in her, hand, holding in her hands, the nanoseconds she used to explain the speed of modern computing. A nanosecond is the distance that light travels in a billionth of a second. Each nanosecond is 11.8 inches long. During these years, in addition to being the recipient of numerous medals, awards, and honorary degrees, Hopper gained international as well as national fame. In 1973, she became the only woman and the only American to be made a distinguished fellow of the British Computer Society. Arrayed in full dress uniform, she'd been escorted to the London event by Lord Louis Mountbatten, a cousin of Queen Elizabeth. 
Addressing the guests after dinner, Hopper began, as she always did, by thanking them for the award. Then, as always, she said that for her, there was only one higher award, the privilege and responsibility of serving proudly in the United States Navy. Hopper later admitted that she wondered whether she should say such a thing in a foreign country, and then it decided she would anyway. She knew she'd made the right decision when Mountbatten, himself an admiral in the Royal Navy, said to her as she sat down, oh, well done, Captain. She never forgot that. It moved her deeply. Indeed, Hopper's touch was sure in all sorts of situations, from giving talks to American high school computer clubs to dealing with foreign royalty. This she had a chance to demonstrate again when she was invited to Stockholm to receive an honorary doctorate to be presented by the King of Sweden. As was required, Hopper wore full evening dress, full Navy evening dress. This consisted of a long straight black skirt with gold cummerbund, a white ruffled shirt with a small velvet tie, a white mess jacket and a tiara with Navy insignia. Award recipients were all instructed that when they received the diploma from the provost, they should then turn to face the king. The men should bow and the women curtsy. In the first place, Hopper enjoyed recalling, I knew darn well you couldn't curtsy in that straight skirt. And in the second place, if I tried, I'd fall over. Instead, without staying a thing, she just waited her turn. When it came, because she was in naval uniform and the king was a naval officer, she saluted him instead of curtsying. He smiled all over, she said, and it was the only time he smiled during the whole time there. In those final years, Amazing Grace, as her colleagues fond fondly called her, became the Navy's foremost propagandist for its computer program as representative to learned societies, industry associations, and technical symposia. And now I'll just show you um, with, with help a few slides to illustrate Hopper's significance. Next slide, please. Here she's seen at the groundbreaking, groundbreaking, and she's in the middle, obviously, at age 74. Next slide. Groundbreaking was for the oh, data, Naval Data Automation Center right there in San Diego, named for her, which I visited in 2002. If you get a chance, if you have any time off, I strongly urge you to go visit. They have a wonderful small Hopper Museum with lots of memorabilia, and they're very welcoming. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here she is in 1985 being promoted to Rear Admiral, a White House celebration with Ronald Reagan, obviously. Myth number four was that Hopper was the first female admiral in the Navy. No, she was the sixth. The first was in 1972, this is 1985, the head of the Navy Nurse Corps. Finally, in 1986, the years caught up with Hopper and she was forced to retire for a second time. The unfortunate John Lehman had had the duty of informing her of that, as well as the much harder job of telling the same thing to Hyman Rickover. And if you know anything about Rickover, you'll understand why it was much harder to get him out. Next slide, please. Here's the cover of Chips Magazine, the Navy computing magazine that Hopper had founded. She was then 79 years old and had spent 43 years in the Navy. On her retirement, she was the oldest serving officer in the US Armed Forces. Next slide, please. Grace Hopper died at home in her sleep on the 1st of January, 1992, and was buried with full military honors in Arlington National Cemetery, as the New York Times obituary highlighted. Quickly, tributes poured in from around the world, but in the end, it was the US Navy that paid the greatest tribute of all when it named a formidable high-tech warship after this female mathematician who never went to sea. Next slide, please. In 1996, the Arleigh Burke class Aegis um, guided missile destroyer, USS Hopper, was launched uh, by Bath Ironworks and was commissioned in 1997 in San Francisco. Next slide, please. Here's the USS Hopper, the DDG-70, at sea in 1998. She's home ported right there with you in San Diego. One of Hopper's repeated mantras was that ships in port are safe, but that's not what ships are for. Be good ships, sail forth, and do great deeds. Fittingly, the motto of the USS Hopper is do and dare. 
In 2000, Harvard tore down its computer center, which they'd named for Howard Aiken. A captain in the, uh, caption in the university magazine reading, Aiken, adieu. Today, perhaps unfairly, Hopper's name is much better known than that of Howard Aiken. And it is she, not he, who symbolizes the Navy's early, early computer scientists in uniform. Ironically, while the building name for Aiken disappeared, the Navy had already built and named the one for Hopper. Next slide, please. Finally, here's the official portrait of Admiral Grace Hopper. John F. Lehman, who served as Secretary of the Navy for six years from 1981 to 1987, um, as he told me, worked with Hoffer from time to time and was largely responsible for pushing her promotion to Admiral in 1983. By the time he first met her, she was already 74 years old. According to Lehman, Grace Hopper was not the least intimidated by what he called the natural resistance to change and inertia of every big bureaucracy. She had a tremendously forceful and creative personality, as well as a sense of humor, he recalled. She was very, very bright, he told me when I interviewed him, and she drove the Navy into the computer age with whips and scourges. Surely that's not a bad accomplishment for one little old lady. Thank you. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Kathy. That was outstanding. And uh, really great presentation. Thank you, Sam. Can I just read to you two other things that are rather important, that I find rather important? One, there are two things that Grace Hopper said. One is, it's easier to ask forgiveness afterwards than permission before. And she acted on that all her life. And the other one was, computers never have a new idea. They have no imagination. They do only what they are told to do. And I think those are both lovely. Thanks, Sam, I'm finished. Okay, um, I wish we had more time for questions. But is it okay uh, if we have people contact you by email, perhaps? To... I wish they would. That would be much better for me also. I'm just not very good at ad-libbing. So thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much.